All right. The Most High, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Nazareth, bless us all. So let's go to the book of John, chapter 1. So next Friday at sundown will be the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. I mean, uh, not next Friday, next Sabbath, next Saturday night, I'm sorry. Next Saturday night at sundown is the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So let's read some scriptures on the Passover. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29 is where we'll begin. So next Saturday at even. After the seventh day Sabbath will be the Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread. From Saturday sundown to Sunday sundown. So we'll start to read a little on the Passover. So John chapter 1 verse 29. So it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. So as John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing the children of Israel, the Lord now is coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So John the Baptist is declaring Jesus as the what? The Lamb of God. The Lamb provided of God that would take away our sins. That's who he's declaring Jesus as. Now, he's mentioning Jesus as the Lamb of God. Notice how the word Lamb is in capital L. Because this is the Lamb of Lambs. This is the Lamb of God, provided of God, to give us salvation. So, John is emphasizing Jesus as the Lamb of God, which was to take away our sins. Because when we go back to... Exodus chapter 12 let's go to Exodus chapter 12 is where we kept the first Passover and there was a lamb that had to be sacrificed that was involved in us keeping the Passover so let's go to Exodus chapter 12 verse 1 so this is a lamb that would be provided of God, which was to take away our sins. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. You got a new Bible, brother? Bill? No, same one. Oh, same one, okay. Nice. Uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. So it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of where? Egypt. Saying so, now we go into the time where the children of Israel are in the land of Egypt. And we know that Egypt's part is part of the land continent known as what Africa. So, Israel is in Egypt. What condition are they in? Bondage, right? Remember the Ten Commandments I am the Lord thy God, which I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, captivity. So the children of Israel were in captivity under the Egyptians. So this was a little over 400 years of captivity that Israel was under in the land of Egypt. On this day, Israel was going to be set free. So that's read verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So the, the month that Israel was going to come out of Egypt would be the beginning. It, it, it is the beginning of our months, beginning of our moons, the beginning of the year. So just a scripture to add to that, go to Exodus chapter 13. And we'll read verse 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 3. So, Exodus chapter 3, verse 3. Chapter 
I'm sorry, Exodus 13. <laughs> sorry about that. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came up out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall be no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. See, so the first month of the year is known as Abib. Okay, and this is the time where certain crops started to, plants started to bud, bud forth. Abib. So in the beginning of the year is when we came out of Egypt. So this is the beginning of the year, not how in this world we're taught that January 1st is the beginning of our month's beginning of the year. No, it's actually during the time of the budding forth. So it's the month of Bib. And the month of Bib always will pretty much will will, will be in, in mid to late March, the month of March, the beginning of the year. And then once we get to the new moon of the, the first year, then we count 14 days, 14 day at even is the Passover. So by strength, the Most High brought us up out of Egypt. The Most High brought great plagues upon the Egyptians. And the last plague the Most High was going to bring was the destruction of Pharaoh, the God of Egypt, in at the Red Sea. After we would eat the Passover lamb and when we... Well, let's go to Exodus 12. There was blood from the lamb that had to be sprinkled upon the doorposts of our homes as a sign that we were keeping the Passover so that the angel that would pass over would spare our homes from death. But wherever in the land of Egypt there was not blood upon the doorposts of the homes, all the firstborn in that home were killed. And that was the most high bringing judgment upon the Egyptians. So we're going to read a little about that here in Exodus 12. So let's go to the third verse now of Exodus 12. So we're Exodus 12 and 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, meaning the month of Bib, the first month of the year, on the tenth day, they shall take to them every man a lamb. See, so now remember it's, the beginning of the first month of the year, the Most High is through Moses, Most High through Moses giving instruction to Israel about keeping the Passover. So on the 10th day of the first month of the year, Bib, the, 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 the congregation of Israel was to take a lamb, a lamb, According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So you would get a lamb for each house. Now let's see what the purpose of this lamb was. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. So let's say a whole lamb for a smaller household, you know, that, small, that household is too small, then they would join with their next door neighbor and that one lamb would be sufficient for both households. So it says, I'll read that again. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now, now this is Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. So it says, your lamb shall be without what? Blemish. So on the 10th day, a lamb had to be picked out, and this lamb had to be without any kind of like blemish or defect. Couldn't have anything wrong with it. It had to be a sound lamb. Couldn't have any defects, something wrong with it. Like, oh, you know, that missing an eye or something, you know, where it was without, it had to be without blemish. 
So right there, we're, we're, this is prefiguring who John described Jesus as. The Lamb of what? The Lamb of God, the Lamb provided of God. Because we're going to read in this chapter where this Lamb here was, was a sacrifice. Just like Jesus Christ would become a sacrifice for us. So it says, Your Lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So the lamb was picked out on the 10th day, right? Had to be without blemish. Had to be of the first year. And then, kind of like you kept your eye on it. You know, for the days leading up to the 14th, you fed it, kept your eye on it. Because you know, oh, this is the lamb that's going to be sacrificed here. So the lamb was fed. So, and then what happened on the 14th day? It says, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So on the 14th day of the first month, the, the lamb had to be killed. Now, so it was killed between the 13th day of the first month at even and the 14th day of the first month at even. So the 14th day of the month at even, meaning between the 13th day of the first month at even and the 14th day of the first month at even. One thing we want to point out is in the six verses, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lamb provided of God, he was killed at Jerusalem on the 14th day of the first month. In the scriptures, we're going to go in the scriptures to prove that. So in verse 5, it's mentioning a lamb, right? Of the without blemish. That's prefigured Christ being without sin. Verse 6 tells us when does lamb had be killed in Egypt on the 14th day of the first month. Thousands and thousands of years later, Jesus Christ, the Lamb provided of God, was killed on the 14th day of the first month during the preparation of the Passover. And notice how it said that the whole, the whole congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So all Israel, wherever, you know, when we were in the land of Goshen and the land of Egypt, we had to kill the Lamb all at the same time. We were all killing the Lamb on the 14th day. So all those verses 5 and 6 prefigured Christ, foreshadowed Christ. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. So we're going to go back to this Exodus 12. You know, whatever we don't finish, we'll continue next Sabbath. And then the following day, we'll actually keep the Passover. So we got at least two, Lord willing, two seven-day Sabbath classes, two classes to, you know, read on the Passover. Of course, you can read on your own as well. So let's read Hebrews chapter 9. So it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ? In other words, this sacrifice, the sacrifice of the blood of Christ is, is greater than the sacrifice of the, of the old covenant. That's why I said how much more. How much more shall the blood of Christ the blood that he spilled on the cross that he was nailed to. On During the 14th day of the first month. During the preparation of the Passover. That has to be emphasized. How much more shall the blood of Christ. Who through the eternal spirit. See. Through the spirit offered himself. Jesus Christ offered himself without what? 
without spot. Just like we were reading in Exodus chapter 12. What were we reading in Exodus 12? Let's go back to that point. Just hold this in our Hebrews 9. Exodus 12 and 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. The Passover lamb that had to be killed in Egypt had to be perfect, sound, without blemish. And then we're reading here in Hebrews 9, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, see, he offered himself as a sacrifice for Israel unto who? God. See, because those sacrifices were done under the old covenant by the priests unto the Most High for Israel. Well, Christ said, I'm going to take place of these animal sacrifices. I'm going to offer myself that's without sin. And I'm going to bear their sins upon myself on the cross. And that's what Christ did. He offered himself through the eternal spirit without spot unto God. So, is, would that be greater than animal sacrifice? Knowing that the Son of God, not just any man, because any man can say, I'll die for Israel. Moses said, look, blot out my name out of the book of life. Moses was not without sin. He could, that wouldn't be sufficient. So knowing that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, right, came on this earth from the, from, he was with God, right, before the world was, he was with God throughout the history of the world. He came on this earth to Joseph and Mary, it behooved Christ to be made like us. Came on this earth, conceived, born on this earth, lived his life without sin, began his ministry, preaching, repentance, preaching the kingdom of God. He taught repentance. He taught people that we must repent from sin in order to make it to the kingdom of God. And we must believe upon him. He taught us that to know, to be taught and learn of the Father, we have to go through him. And that without being born again, being born of the spirit of the Most High in Christ, the comfort of the spirit of truth, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Christ healed the sick, rose the dead to life, preached the word of God with great power. No man ever spake like that man. He reproved the world of sin and he suffered. The chief priests, elders, and scribes of Israel came together against the Most High and against Christ. They came together, conspired together to kill Christ during the preparation of the Passover because men love darkness rather than light. You would think, man, when you look at the, the, the example of Christ, everybody in the world should have followed and been obedient to him. Because when you actually read the teachings of Jesus Christ, he, he was without fault. He was without sin. He was blameless. What did he teach the first commandment of all was? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What fault can we find with that? The second commandment that is like the first, he taught, love your neighbor as yourself. That when it came to, to people actually living according to those two precepts, those two commandments, and Christ bringing out in the way that they were living, that they were not living according to those commandments. The same laws that, especially the circumcision of Israel, claimed to keep or portrayed themselves to keep, they didn't follow. And they turned against him who taught those commandments. So Christ was hated of all men for the Father's sake, just like those that follow Christ are going to be hated for all men, by all men, for the Lord's sake. If Christ suffered, we will suffer too. 
but Christ said that he would not leave us comfortless. He said, in this world, you're going to have great tribulation and sorrow, but in me, you're going to have inner peace and inner joy. Because the spirit of the Most High Christ will be with us to help us endure and overcome temptations and trials and find that inner joy and inner peace for suffering for the Lord's sake. So I'll read it again, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, meaning the sacrifice of Christ is greater than the animal sacrifices because the sacrifice of Christ is about what? Purging, let's read it, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, the animal sacrifices never purged our conscience from dead works, sin, to serve the true and living God. It was like we just, you know, the priest would offer the sacrifice of animals on our behalf, and we didn't really understand that obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, we didn't understand that the point of these sacrifices is to get right, get your mind right. Not to rely on these sacrifices year after year after year, especially on the Day of Atonement, year after year, and not get right. But when we understand that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came on this earth and he bared our sins on the, on the cross that he was nailed to and suffered on that cross and spilled his blood on, on that cross for our sins, that's going to have like a profound effect. On our, on our conscience, our, our mind to, 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 be, to be of the mind to what? Man, Christ died for sin. He suffered on the cross. He, he was without sin. He knew no sin. He became sin for me. That I might serve the living God. That's, that, 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 of, that, of the, the, you know, that effect that, it, that the blood of Christ spilling his, you know, spilling his blood for us, it has a very strong effect where it, 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 it Causes us to what? Want to get right with the Most High in Christ. To repent from sin, right? Dead works. To be baptized. Because what's tied to repenting from our sins and being baptized in water? The, the Spirit of the Heavenly Father in Christ being within us, being among us. And through the spirit of the Most High in Christ, the word, see, the Most High putting his word in our heart, right? In our spirit, because we're humbling ourselves, of that being of that broken, contrite spirit. There's a change that takes place, and it's the purging of our what? Conscience and mind. See, so it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. And what is the blood of Christ, when, you know, you know, cause us to do? Repent, to get right, repent, get baptized. Call on the name of the Lord. And by doing so, we draw nigh to God, he draw nigh to us. And by the most I draw near to us, like Christ said, my father and I will make our abode with him, with her. And that's how we get right. That's how we overcome whatever sins that we're taken captive by. You know, slowly but surely, we put off the spirit of lust and anger and pride and covetousness and all the other you know works of the flesh inner emotions that lead to what dead works murders it that's dead works what causes murder anger wrath hatred so we have to purge hatred anger we have to learn self-control we have to learn to not give in to the flesh and be violent you know fighting saying hurtful things um Adultery, fornication, that's a work of the flesh. What causes a man or a woman to commit adultery, fornicate, lust? See, so what's going to purge our conscience from these? The blood of Christ, knowing that Christ died for us. So I want to get a scripture. And, um, let me see. Um, so that was pretty much it on that. I just wanted to get that one verse. Go to, <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two. And verse sixteen. First Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen. 
It says for I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and So 1 Corinthians 2, that's not the scripture I want to go. So the scripture I'm looking for is, um, he that knew no sin, he came sin for us. Somebody can help me find that. He, uh, he that knew no sin became sin for us. I think it's in Corinthians. It's the top of my mind. I can't get it. Let me see. Second Corinthians 5 and 21. Oh, okay. That's good. There it is. Thank you, brother. Second Corinthians 5, 20. Well, I don't know why I was thinking 1 Corinthians 2. Yeah, this is... I'd like to read verse 17 first. And then we'll read verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What did Christ teach Nicodemus, a master in Israel, a master of the law? What is it? That one must do in order to enter into the kingdom of God. He must be what? Baptized. Born again. Go ahead. Go Born again. Born again, right. Born again. So he taught that a man must be born again. Meaning what? Be a new what? Creature. Creature. So we might say, well, I'm not so bad. You know, I'm, I, I don't, you know, I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. Do we get angry? You know, I, I don't commit adultery. Do you lust? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get angry sometimes. I, I get mad sometimes. I get wrathful sometimes. Sometimes I'm lusting, but I, don't, I, I look, but I don't touch. What, what did Christ say about those things? Let's get hold this, right? Go to Matthew 5. Just hold that scripture, though. In Corinthians, Second Corinthians five. Go to Matthew chapter five. Let's read from verse twenty one. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. So this is one of the what? Ten commandments, is it not? Thou shalt not kill. That's one of the ten commandments. Where is that in the ten commandments? Exodus 20 and verse 13. God commanded, thou shalt not kill. So... God said not to kill. The prophets taught not to kill, right? Your father and mother taught you not to kill. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So what was the judgment if you killed, murdered somebody? What was the judgment? There's... Go to, go to Leviticus 24, 17. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. What was the judgment for murder? Remember, this is not speaking so much on the behalf of self-defense. Or when Israel went to war. We're talking about killing a man out of malice, 
out of hatred or anger, premeditated. So this is Leviticus 24, 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. So does the Most High take murder lightly? No. You know, the Most High does not take murder lightly. Go, go, hold, uh, we're finished with that one, right? That's Leviticus 24, 17. Go to Genesis 9 and 6. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Let's read this scripture. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. So the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. And so you want to write these scriptures down, highlight them. These are the scriptures. When we read them, they keep us in check. Start to feel a little anger, right? Wrathful, bitter, resentful, hateful. It can lead to greater sin than already those thoughts of sin. And then this, you know, scripture like this will keep us in check. It'll keep us in check. It'll be like, whoa, man, let me control my thoughts here. So Genesis 9 and 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, what is that? Murder, right? By man shall his blood be what? Shed. So when a man shed, shed another man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And it would usually be the nearest of kin, the avenger. For in the image of God made he man, see? So man was made in the image and likeness of God. So you just can't, I mean, people don't look at their fellow man like this anymore. And when you, when you, you know, I see you, you you're made in the image of, of God's likeness. You know, even other people, other nations, they're, they're still made in the image of the Most High's likeness in the sense that, yeah, we're maybe we're the chosen people, but that don't mean that now we can do something evil to them. Okay, Joseph didn't commit adultery with, with an Egyptian. He could have been like, well, that's not really adultery. It is adultery, even with an, uh, an Egyptian. You know, an Egyptian. He said, how can I do this great sin? How can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? So, you know, we can't be of the mind to just, you know, ha have that in us to want to take, kill somebody, period. Because in the image of God made he them. For in the image of God made he man. So we see the most high in Christ in one another. When you see your brother, your sister, especially, that's they're made in the image and likeness of God. They're a, a reflection of the most high, of the most high's image. So we're not supposed to have that frame of mind where, you know, to shed somebody's blood like we're spilling water or something like that. But Look, check this scripture out. Go to, uh, uh, I think it's Ecclesiastes 10. In the Apocrypha, right? Ecclesiastes 10 in the Apocrypha. What's the 10th chapter? Might be the eight. 
uh, I'm sorry, it was the eighth chapter. Please ask this eight. Let's see what mark is that? The orange mark, please. Ecclesiastes 8. So sorry about that. Oh, that's Ecclesiastes 8. Strive not with an angry man. So have we ever, have we ever came across 8.16? Ecclesiastes 8.16, sorry. Ecclesiastes 8.16. In the Apocrypha. Strive not with an angry man. How many of us ever came across somebody that angry? Especially angry towards us. Whether provoked or unprovoked. Really, we should, you know, be provoking somebody. That's a good circumstance to be in. That someone may be angry towards us. Well, the scriptures say don't strive with that person. Don't contend with that person. Don't go back and forth with that person. Strive not with an angry man. And go not with him into a solitary place. What happens if you go into a solitary place with a man that's angry? What might happen? Yeah. yeah. A lot of fights end up like that. That people, all right, oh, you want, you want, let's let's go in the back, let's go in the alley, let's go behind the building, let's go to the rooftop. You never go into a solitary place with an angry man. Avoid that. That's wisdom in itself, right there. You gotta know your surroundings. Man, that's angry. Like, look, you start looking around. Like, I need to get out of here, man. Well, he's encouraging me. All right, let's. You know, the guy's angry. What? Going back and forth. All right, let, let's go over here, man. Just me and you alone. The guy's angry. What can get in the way? Our pride, right? Now we're going to what? Go toe for toe, tip for tat. Yeah, let's go. Let's Come on, let's go, man. Meet me here. We at the job now. Meet me here. Let's go behind the back. See? Strive now with an angry man. And go not with him into a solitary place. For blood is as nothing and is what? Is he thinking this man is made in the image and likeness of God? No. What are you to him? What he sees himself as. What? Whatever byword we want to use. Okay, people that's out here killing, murdering one another, they don't love themselves. That's a fact. These brothers out here killing, bang, gang banging, involved in not just murder, but things similar, you know, human trafficking. They, they don't love themselves, man. When a man is ready to... Doesn't that man know that if I kill this guy, I got to meet my maker, you know? If I kill this guy, I'm going to end up in jail. They don't care. They don't care about meeting their maker, so you know, until that happens. And some Israel that I'll go to I don't care, I'll run things in jail. See, until they get in jail, then oh it's it's different now. See? But people that's out here killing one another, they don't love themselves, man. And when you don't love yourself, they when you don't have no self worth, you know, you don't have any morals, you you, you don't feel you don't love yourself. You don't nourish and cherish your body. You're not going to nourish and cherish. You're not going to care about somebody else. That's why blood is just nothing in, in their what? In their sight. They'll spill blood, right? They'll stab you and, and watch you bleed, shoot you, and keep shooting you. Bah, 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 bah. They're stabbing you. Blood. You're already dead. And when they spill that blood, <laughs> they'll walk away and have a drink. Like it's nothing. So should we be striving with people like that? <laughs> Knowing that they have the potential to spill your blood and not think twice about it? That's what an angry man does. That's why we should avoid what? 
those circumstances, or, or if we're in the midst of those circumstances, flee from sinners from the face of the serpent. For if thou comest too near it, like I say in Ecclesiastes, it will what? Bite thee. So, things can heat up quick. In a matter of small moments, right? Just a matter of moments, words being exchanged, things got hot quick. Things got heated quick. Fighting pop up. Next thing you know, somebody dead. Where it could have been what? Avoided on the man's part that should discern that what? Okay, this brother, you know, this man here, he, he, he's angry to the point where he wants to take me to a solitary place. What's his intentions? <laughs> he wants to kill me and try to get away with it. So why would I go there with him? Unless I'm filled with what? Pride. See, because that's what gets in our way. Pride. I ain't going to go out like that. There were many times where they came to get Christ. And Christ avoided them. He w went through the midst of them. He got out of it. He didn't stand his ground and be like, because he, we, you know, Christ knew that his hour has not yet come. There are times, things that we, we, we can't avoid. This is talking about something that can be avoided. So blood for blood is just nothing in his sight. And where there is no help, he will what? Overthrow thee. See, that's why he wants to get you in a solitary place. Why? Because if no one's there to help you, what's going to happen? He's going to what? Overthrow you like Cain overthrew Abel. Just like Cain killed Abel. See, same thing. Let's read the third verse. Strive not with a man that is what? Full of tongue and heap not wood upon his what? Fire. See, so you, you know how people can get being disrespectful, taunting, provoking. Don't go striving with a man that is that just, he's loose with the tongue, aggressive, brash. Uh, how you say? Um, provoking, right? But remember, I'm sorry, uh, and heap not wood upon his what? Fire. How do we heap wood upon his fire? By going toe for toe, tit for tat, word for word, striving for striving. He's saying provoking words. You're saying provoking. Yeah, it's just an exchange going back and forth. Back. What's going? You, you know what you're doing. He's already. It's a, it's a fire already going, and you're just throwing logs in the fire by what's coming out of our mouth. So we have to learn to what. Rule our tongue. Rule our spirit first, right? Because if we don't rule our spirit, we're going to rule what come out of our mouth. No. So we have to rule our spirit, and then when we rule our spirit, our behavior is going to dictate the outcome of the situation for the, for the most part. Scripture says soft answer. Get that one, Proverbs 15, right? Yes, sir. You are right there. You want to read also verse 10? Verse 10, okay. talking about that. Yes, sir. Uh, 10 and 10, brother. So it says... 8 and 10. 8 and 10, I'm sorry. 8 and 10, right. Kindle not the coals of a sinner, lest thou be burnt with the flame of his what? Because you heaping the wood on the fire. So now you're going to burn, be burned by the flame of his fire. Why? Because you're kindling the coals of a sinner. How are you kindling it? By going, striving with the man, contending with the man. So, you know, sometimes we're in situations where it might not lead to death, but it could lead to a fight. And a fight, you can kill somebody. You got to think of it like that. I mean, you hit somebody a certain way in the right, right you, can, you can put them in the hospital easily. Knock somebody out, and then they, they fall back, hit their head on the corner of a table, and then that killed them. But, you know, maybe it wasn't your punch, but it knocked them off. So, you know, what gets in the way of our pride? So, uh, Proverbs 15. So, we have to be aware of circumstances and discern. And don't be simple-minded and foolish and allow ourselves to be enticed and seduced and to be getting involved in situations where we're arguing with people and then fighting with people. 
Next thing you know, sisters pulling each other's hair and slapping each other and <laughs> wrestling on the floor. You got these idiots, uh, world star, you know, and it's just, now we look bad. We got to rule our spirit. So this is uh, Proverbs 15. You know, we, we apply this on levels where even where just somebody just got the wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. you know, we all have occupied say well uh, jobs. We, have, we all gotta deal with people at our jobs. Some people already got attitudes, right? They're angry, they're having a bad day. And we gotta catch ourselves. Because it'd be like, man, who do you think you're talking to, man? <laughs> you know, it's like Huh? Yeah, they can be very grievous. Like they're provoking. They got an attitude. They being disrespectful. That's hard to stomach. Disrespectful people. Like, Who do you think you're talking to like that? You know, it's like we just have to rule our spirit and try to respectfully communicate. There's no need to be loud and disrespectful, right? And then take it from there. So this is Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer turneth away what? Wrath. Wrath. So somebody can be angry to the point where they're being wrathful. And they're unleashing it at you. Sometimes we don't even know who these people is. We don't even know who they are. It's the first time we've seen them in our life. <laughs> they're coming like that. <laughs> Like what's wrong? So that's how we know. Don't take it what personal. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, you know, especially on the highways out here. Man, I don't even know this guy. He, let me try to get home safe and sound without going to jail or whatever. See, or on the job especially. No matter who it is, whether we know him or not, always understand the Most High has given us the wisdom to know that. A soft answer will turn away the wrath and fury of man. They could be coming, and it's just one word. Hey, brother, you know, I ain't got no problems with you. Let's talk this out. All this, they're like, <laughs> you know, now, now, all right, hey, bro, you know, let's, 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 let's try to figure this out here. Now I'm just saying, well, hey, brother, if I says, hey, let's talk about it, let's, let's, Let's try to make some peace here. See, a soft answer turn of the way wrath. He's going to say something. In Ecclesiastes, uh -huh. uh, verse 17, says, Consult not with a fool, be cannot give counsel. So how do you use soft words when someone is not keeping counsel to those soft words? Yeah. Um, you know, we have to trust in the Most High that the guy's wrathful. Are you you're talking about someone that you just you, you're, you're trying to you're trying oh you're, you're trying, trying to, to be you're trying and, and you're not getting anywhere with that person. Well, you know, trust in the process, and have the faith that a soft answer will turn it away wrath. Mm -hmm. The next part says the grievous words will only is only going to stir up the anger even more because now we're heaping wood upon the coals of his fire. So what happens in a circumstance where, um, you know, no matter what we're saying, they're not calming down. What do you mean? Like they're trying to approach us or physic like get physical is kind of what you're saying or disrespectful in their words. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends what the if your life is on the line, we have to discern. If it's more like you got to walk away from it, then, hey, you know, hey, look, brother, I'm trying to talk this out with you. I'm trying to be, you know, we're not getting anywhere. So I'm just going to walk away. You know, and uh, peacefully, I got no problem when you just walk. Sometimes we, sometimes we can walk away. Maybe somebody has to protect and defend themselves. You know, and, the, and if that's what we have to do, so be it. But, you know, this scripture is just giving us the wisdom that, you know, a soft answer. To, it's not saying that if it doesn't, if a man is not changing, he's trying to hurt you, that we don't try to either walk away if we can at all costs, you know, carefully, don't turn our back, you know, we'll step back and... Um, you know, so there's 
you know, it depends what the circumstances is, you know. Um, again, we're not dealing with, you know, uh, what was that scripture you quoted? Ecclesiastes 8, 17. Let, let me read that. Please ask us eight seventeen. It was right before I read after. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that verse. Because the the uh, please ask eight sixteen. That's talking about um, not striving with a man that's angry, mm -hmm. right? The next verse talks about consult not with a fool, for he cannot keep counsel. So it's really dealing with trying to diffuse the situation. It's not really dealing on the level of counseling a brother, even though you kind of are. You counsel him, hey, look, let's try to. This is talking about this guy's a foolish man. He doesn't keep counsel. He doesn't observe counsel. You give him counsel. He doesn't listen to you. He does the opposite. He mocks. He scorns. And no counsel with him. That's what it's telling us. Counsel not with counsel. Consult not with a fool. You know, I, I don't consult with a man that's a foolish man because he's not going to listen to counsel. He or you wouldn't consult with a fool because it's saying because he cannot keep. He's not a counselor. Him. He's not a man to counsel with. He's not. He doesn't observe. He, like, I'm counseling with somebody that cannot keep counsel. I'm counseling with a man that's, I'm, not, I'm seeking counsel, I'm consulting with somebody that's not a counselor. Like, this guy, he's a foolish guy. So, it's kind of a dis different kind of set of circumstances. It's, it's going more into, uh, just like the next verse. It said, do no secret thing before a stranger, for thou knowest not what he will bring forth. So, it's just giving us wisdom on different levels. And the 16th verse, strive not with an angry man. Don't go into a solitary place with him because he'll spill your blood like it's nothing. The next part said, don't consult with a fool because he can't keep counsel. Then the next part said, do no secret thing before a stranger for thou knowest not what he will bring forth. Right, so I'm not going to be on my phone next to a stranger and I'm putting in my, you know, my uh, credit card information. I don't know this guy can take, you know, so that's what it's saying. So it's just wisdom on different levels. So the part where we were reading Proverbs 15 where it says, you know, um, a soft answer turneth away wrath, and the point was being brought out that we're trying to, like, reason with the person. That scripture in Ecclesiastes is talk more about consulting with a man. Don't consult with a man that can't keep counsel. He's not a counselor. He can't. He doesn't have counsel to, for you to consult with him. He's not. He can't give you good advice because... He's that he doesn't have that mind, you know. It's certain things, you know, certain people, you know, you're going through issues in your marriage. I'm not going to consult with that. He can't keep counsel, man. You know, I, I'm having issues in my marriage. I'm going to talk to this guy here that's been with 13 different women. The last woman, they got in a fight, <laughs> you know, they got arrested or one of them got arrested. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to ask him. He can't keep counsel. He, he, he's not, he doesn't have counsel to help me. So, going back to uh, Proverbs 15, right? A soft answer turneth away wrath. We have to have faith that a soft answer will turn away wrath. Now, could there be circumstances where we come in with this soft answer and it don't turn away wrath? It's possible. You know, it, it's, 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 you know, there, there are people that, you know, they're unreasonable. But this is the most I've given us wisdom and instruction and counsel that when somebody's coming with that anger, how we respond, the tone of our voice, the inflection of our voice, <laughs> what we say can simmer that man down. You can bring him down to 10, to a 1, to a 0 just by our words. Yeah. So, did you want to... Uh, I was just going to add... It, yeah. Like... It's definitely situational. Exactly, brother. Your soft response could be something that angers him or them or her. So, there's, again, we'll, we'll stay with its simplicity. Right. It's, it's just the wisdom of somebody who's not a fool, somebody who counts impossibly for yeah. the first time. I just wanted to throw that in there yeah. because it's. Yeah, I mean, there are circumstances. Well, we're trying to do the right thing yeah. by yeah. other people. Some people are unreasonable. Mm -hmm. 
so and they still so then we have to discern that and act accordingly. Okay, now what does wisdom teach me there? Does wisdom teach me, okay, I just need to step back, walk away. And there's no more talking, it's unreasonable. That might be the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Or it might be with a person trying to get you to have to defend yourself. You know, so there's wisdom for that. You know, so it's all circumstantial. But what this is teaching us here in Proverbs 15 and 1 is to have the, the faith and the wisdom and counsel and instruction of God that when somebody's angry, that it isn't the power of the inflection of our voice, the tone of our voice, and the words that we say that could deflect, you know, um, not deflect, but can, um, um, there's a crisis. So now it's like it's, now it's, it's heated, but it could be brought down from 10 to 1. You, you just going to add, say something, brother? Well, what about Proverbs 22, 24? Proverbs what? Proverbs 22. So it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Right, so that goes with what we read in Ecclesiasticus, mm -hmm. you know. Um, don't try to make a friendship with a man that's angry, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Don't go in the path. Because if, because you know, and 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 what we're reading here, we say, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Thou shalt not go. That's just not talking about the guy's angry at you. It could be an angry man. Period. Like, you know, there's certain dudes I, I grew up with that I knew that they angry like this. They'll get in a fight like this. I mean, literally, man. Like, you 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 know, you you're in a store. And, uh, you know, you order ordering food, you know, uh, 10 seconds later, you turn around and your boys you fight. That, that happened. There's places where when I was younger and I didn't know this wisdom, you know, I'm hanging, I'm hanging out with dudes that are like, what the hell just happened? The dude's fighting, beating the dude up in, in the Burger King. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what the hell's going on? Now, you know, I had no discernment if it's a Burger King. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's crazy stuff. Or like, you know, you you walking, hanging out somewhere, you somewhere, and the next thing, what you doing? Blah, 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 blah. And next thing, now they fighting. Now it's them two fighting. Now it's five on five, ten on ten. Now you're in the middle of it. That's what this is going into. Don't make an acquaintance with a man that's known to be what? Angry. And then when it says, and with a furious man, thou shalt not go. So with the man in it, whether he has the... the uh, I don't know if he has the not the ability it's not really if he has the man, I'm trying to think of the right word he has the disposition to be angry or he's in an angry state don't be with that guy and with a furious man thou shalt not go yo you know yo let's get this dude what what happened man, yeah, let's go don't don't go you ever had somebody come to you they're angry and then somebody messing with them yeah, that dude over there across the street, man. Yo, man, he's just said this, 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 and that. Yo, man, I'm going to F him up now. Uh, come on, let's go. Yeah, man, I got you. Let's go. Where's he at? What are you doing? You going with that guy? Y'all, what, what could happen? Somebody get killed. You get killed. Other people get killed. Or you get arrested. But a furious man, thou shalt not go. That's why I say, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to what? I saw, see. So it, you, you know that the person has the disposition to be angry. I, 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 you're an angry dude. I, I can't be hanging with you. Why not, man? What's wrong? <laughs> That's what's wrong right there. Unstable. Huh? Unstable. Yeah, you, you're unstable, man. Bro, you get heated way too quick, man. You be ready to fight, man. Like, you, you ready to pull out a knife, pull out a gun. You ready to punch somebody upside their head. Like, over stuff, bro. Like, you know, how you in these situations? You got issues. You got anger issues. Because what happens, lest thou learn his what way. So you start hanging around with him, now you take on that personality. Because a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You, 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 you start to take on the traits and personality of the ones you start rolling with. And then you start not... Like, you hanging with dudes like, man, that's, I'm not like that, man. I'm not just be trying to hurt people like that for no reason. Or over things that, over foolishness that, because he angry, 
Now you angry and now you're like two peas in a pod. Best thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So now you get entrapped. You caught up in a snare because you, you made friendship with a man that's what has a disposition to be angry and, and to be furious. You don't go nowhere with him. You ain't going to movies with that guy. He ain't going to cl clubs. He ain't going to no clubs at all. But he's going to go to clubs, you know. I'm just going back to the older days. You know what I'm saying? He ain't trying to go nowhere. See, this is, man, if I knew this wisdom, man, I, man, I, 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 just, I would know, man, sir, you know, like, especially in high school, you could, you already know, like, right, that dude there, man, that dude's a, he be fighting all the time. That dude, he's a drug dealer there. That dude there, psh, don't mess with that guy. He'll punch you in the head, face, just by looking at him the wrong way. I ain't trying to be friends with that guy. You, you joke too much with him, he'll, you know. So you got to kind of know, like, people, and then, nah, man, I can't hang with you, man. I'm, I'm going to end up in jail. With, I'm going to end up in jail hanging out with you. See? Now, imagine we would have had this wisdom when we were younger. We, we would have avoided, what, the snares that led us to be in situations where we may have gotten arrested, fights, criminal record, served jail time hurt somebody, killed somebody, where the most high wisdom in here teaching is how to avoid these circumstances. Or if we're in the midst of these circumstances, <laughs> cut out. Be not. Oh, okay. So that, so that, so, uh, was you going to say something else, brother? No. Okay. So, um, Proverbs 15, let's go back to that Proverbs 15. Uh, how do we end up in this scripture? <laughs> You was, you was reading Matthew 5, 21. Oh, there you go. Thank you, bro. I'm like, why the heck are we going this time? They ain't on the list of scriptures. <laughs> so, uh, Proverbs 15. A soft answer turneth away wrath. They grieve his words, stir up what? Anger. So that go back to the scripture Luke was saying, go, go to the other verse in that chapter. We're talking about heaping coals of fire upon his... There's a whole bunch of scriptures on that, really. When you keep reading Ecclesiasticus, those, you know, are, are some real good ones. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge, what? All right. See? So we have the knowledge of God, we have to use it, what? Wisely, properly. Oh, so gave us wisdom. He gave us, he gave us knowledge. Now, we have to apply it. We have the tongue of the wise useth knowledge or right. We have to apply God's knowledge in a way where we're dealing right with it. So it says, but the mouth of fools poureth out, poureth out what? Foolishness. See? So a foolish man, a, a, a perverse man, right? A foolish, or the mouth of fools pour out what? Foolishness. Foolish things going to come out of their mouth. You're like, what the heck? You, what are you doing? Man? Why are you talking? And you got rabbit, hey, bro, what's wrong with you, man? No, 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 Bro, you wrong, man. You ain't me talking to people like that. You in the wrong, see? <laughs> yes. Uh, check out verse four. A wholesome tongue is as a tree of life. But the perverseness therein, that perverseness therein is a breach in the what? Spirit. So a breach is like a, a, a break. So a wholesome tongue, see, what, what comes out of our mouth should minister grace to the hearers, right? Especially when it comes to using the knowledge of God aright. You know, a, a man is angry, you know, does he have a cause? Did you offend him? If you did, then we have to use God's name. Hey, brother, I'm sorry, man. You know. I didn't mean to come off like that, man. That, that, that was disrespectful. That's my fault, right? That's using knowledge of right. Let's say you didn't offend him, right? And he's angry. He's coming at you. Then we have to discern and be like, you know, give an example. Uh, hey, I don't know what the problem is, man. I, got no, I don't have a problem with you, brother. You know, what, what you angry at me for? I'm just doing my job. You know, that's, that's, 
that's the protocol. That's you know, that's using the Most High's knowledge of right. But the mouth of fools gonna pour out what foolishness. I get into foolish things, foolish thoughts. I'm a foolish things gonna come out of our mouth, and I'm do something foolish where I'm gonna get hurt. I'm gonna get fired. I'm gonna end up in jail. I'm gonna look bad. People looking at me. Man, what's wrong with you, man? You, hey, man, you lost it. You lost it, bro. That's man. I don't, I, we don't want to live with that, you know. Have a, a name like that. So these are, you know, in the when we're in the midst of these circumstances, it's it's, it's we have to truly swallow our pride, and and we can't be in a state of mind where the scriptures are in one ear or the other. We don't know what to do. We getting all emotional, giving into our emotions, the flesh. The, then what have we been learning in our walk in Christ? We have to apply the scriptures in the midst of the circumstance where it's calling for these scriptures to be applied. <laughs> so it just, there's so much wisdom pertaining to this, but let's go back to Matthew 5, right? Because Christ, we was reading Second Corinthians 5.17 that if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. So scriptures like this help us become a what new creature? Because the old man was he about a soft answer, turn other way wrath at all times? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe if it was your boy, your best friend, right? Or it was your somebody you. But what about if it's somebody you and him and ain't that cool, right? Or it's some some guy being arrogant towards you, some proud, or he talking to you just now, you know. We've all said and did things we regretted. See, and when we look back and we applied these scriptures, we could have avoided those outcomes when we were in the midst of those circumstances. You know, we try to avoid circumstances like that, but sometimes we're in the midst of them. Whether we called it upon ourselves or we did it, we got to apply these scriptures. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, right? Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So what was the what was the judgment for killing someone? We read it. Well, the two scriptures, Leviticus 24, 17, and Genesis, what was it? Six nine and six, right? Most high very serious. The scriptures tell us first Corinthians six, murderers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So we always have to be on guard against what? Being angry towards our brother, especially without a cause. Okay, now if someone offends us, we say be angry, sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Thou shalt any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Now, if you hate somebody and it's out of jealousy or some type of bitterness or resentfulness, e even if they offend us, it's still, you got to be on guard against being angry. So it says, but I, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Why are we in danger of being judged as a murderer? Because in that anger, it may lead to wrath. And in that wrath, it'll lead to what? Bloodshed. In that bloodshed, it might lead to what? Death. So if the Most High said, make no friendship with a furious man, you think the Most High going to have some type of friendship with us? <laughs> Do we expect the Father in Christ to make the abode with us? Where he, the Most High... Give us wisdom not to make friendship with an angry man. You think the Most High in Christ is going to have friendship with us? Abraham was called a friend of the Lord. Show me the scriptures where Abraham got mad. When he delivered his nephew Lot. From, from, that's not anger. That was him delivering his nephew from the five kings that took him captive. But let's get an example of Abraham when it came to strife. Applied himself in what we're teaching. Uh, go to Genesis 15.
So this wisdom we apply what? Not just with strangers in the world, people in the world, people on our jobs, you know, preaching the word. Man, for preaching the word of Christ, we're going to be hated of all men for the Lord's sake. When we truly preach it, we teach in Esau's Christianity, the, the, you ain't going to have no persecution. They're not going to be hated. Because we're preaching a message that what? We can live in sin and, and we can still serve the Lord. But Christ and the apostles of the Lord that he sent for, they were persecuted. Hated. This is Genesis 15. I'm sorry, Genesis 13. Go to Genesis, sorry about that. Genesis 13. Yeah, with me, make sure you write with a pencil. Okay. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Genesis 13. And uh, the old one's hip to the game, as you can see. You know, nah, I'm just teaching. <laughs> Genesis 13. This is a good one here. Genesis 13 and um, 5. And Lot also, so this man Lot, this was um, Abraham's nephew. He was the son of um, Abraham's brother, I believe his name was Haran. So Lot, when we read about Lot, remember when the Lord delivered Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah? Right, am I saying that right? Yeah. Um, Lot was uh, Abraham's nephew. Okay, so say, and Lot also, which went with Abram, because Lot went wherever Abraham went. In the land, this is in the in the land of Israel, the, uh, which was inhabited by the Canaanites too, or by the Canaanites. Abraham was in the promised land, but a stranger in it. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had what? Flocks. Now, let me read it from the first verse. Okay. And Abraham went up out of Egypt. So there was a time period where Abraham was in Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south, and in the southern part of Israel. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. See, so, so what's what what what's true wealth? Like livestock and what it mentions, silver and gold. All right, that's you don't get cryptocurrency, all that other stuff. You get to, uh, trying to market, no, don't get caught up in that. Have having silver and gold, that's always that. No matter what happens, because the dollar bill, the time gonna come where it ain't gonna be worth more than this. Like, hell, this this paper got scriptures on it. This. The dollar bill um, ain't gonna be worth jack. It really isn't now. It's just, it's just a perception of it. Silver and gold. Any in the future, five thousand, two thousand years ago, you could always silver and gold. That comes from the hearth. That's true. That's true. Currency. True. You can buy land. You can buy food with that. You, a lot you could do with silver and gold. So. Abraham was rich in cattle and silver and gold. Verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, when he was first in the land, between Bethel and Ha'ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of who? The Lord. So Abraham worshipped God at this altar. So remember when the woman is, oh, that, this wasn't in Samaria. But um, this, when the woman in Samaria, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did worship in Israel, uh, the Lord, in Samaria. This is not Samaria. The way he actually worshipped Samaria, that's going back in the, the 12th chapter. So this is not Abraham in Samaria. All right, verse 5. So it says, and Lot also went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. So Lot had what? Flocks. He had herds, right? And he had tents. And the land was not able to bear them. So the plot of land where they were residing in at this time wasn't able to bear both Abraham and Lot 
uh, Lot's, you know, uh, possessions, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. So Abraham and Lot, they had so they came out of Egypt rich. Okay, the Pharaoh in Egypt, he was like, gave Abraham all. The Pharaoh in Egypt, he was trying to sleep with Abraham's wife, and the Most High was going to kill him. And at the end, at the Pharaoh was like, "Leave the land, just get out of here." And he gave him all this wealth and power. And then even his nephew Lot came out. They were like starving, man. They were coming out of Egypt with much riches, right? So they get to this point here between Bethel and Ai. And man, there's the, the land can't sustain both of them. Verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. So Abraham has his herdsmen, right? Lot has his herdsmen. There's only so much land. They got all this cattle, you know, and the cattle bringing forth new cattle. They, the land, it's just a small amount of land, and they both, so they, the cattlemen of Lot and, and Abraham were what? Striving, going back and forth. Hey, man, get get off this territory. This is our territory. No, man, this is our territory. No. Man, we with Abraham. Where you think Lot got, where y'all got this? It wasn't, so this is back and forth, right? Okay. And the lot was not able, and the land was not, verse 6, and the, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was so great that they could not dwell together. Verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then, then in the land. So at this point, the Canaanite and the Perizzites the sons of Ham, they were dwelling in, in, the, in the promised land. So Abraham was a stranger in a land that would eventually be given unto him for an everlasting possession. Just like this world we live in now. The world was made for our sakes, but we're strangers in it in the sense that what? Who's ruling? Esau and the other nations. So now verse 8. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we are what? Brethren. Look, we're made in the image and likeness of God. There shouldn't be no strife between me and you or my herdmen. Because Abraham foresaw that what? Foreseen that what? He had, one thing about Abraham, he had great foresight, man. This was a man that thought and behaved always beyond what was on the surface. This brother was always about making moves to amount to himself treasures in the kingdom of God. That's one of the attributes that really, really stand out about Abraham. The man, everything he did, it's seeking the Most High's kingdom and his righteousness first. Everything. And do you think Abraham going to fight with Lot over a land that spiritually he knows this ain't my time yet, you know. So let, let's see what he says here. But check out that that's a heavy thing he said. I pray he said, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. We're brethren, so let there be no strife between your herdsmen and my herdsmen and between me and you. The family, we're brethren. We shouldn't be fighting over land. Okay? That's how we should look at, try to rectify all situations. At the end of the day, we're brothers. So let's sit down and let's make sure there's no strife, man. There's no need for contention between us, especially over land. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray, between thee, between thee, between me. Um, um, let me read that again, verse 8. Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself. Look, we got all this land here. All right? We got, obviously, we can't stay on this, so let's separate ourselves. So he's saying separate He's not saying, look, we're not 
brethren no more. We, we got separated. We got a lot going on. Most are blessing us both. Let's go. See, it's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. For if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. See? See, he going above and beyond. In the sense that Abraham's the greater man. You know? You know, I, look, I'm your, I'm your uncle, man. Left, like, I'm not I'm, look, which side you want the left I'll go to the right you want the right I'll take the left Abraham ain't gonna fight over land that's gonna be given unto him for an everlasting possession at the coming of the Lord the scriptures in Romans tell us that the, the, the unto Abraham and the elect is the world the world is gonna be the Abraham's Abraham getting the world the portion of the world the Lord God for him. you think now in this time he going to let some strife between Lot's herdsmen and his come in between them being brothers. Let there be no strife between me and thee, for we are what brothers? So we should always look at each other in that way in Christ. Okay. Oh, the sister, I offended her. Man, I don't want there no strife. Let me see if I could do something, try to help the situation. So among brothers, sisters, always have this this is loving your neighbors yourself. This is loving God. This is whatever it is, don't let nothing come between us. That's what Abraham's saying. Don't let nothing come between us. Now, in this circumstances, it's the land. It's too big. Fighting over land. You're going to have to separate. You want this side? I'll go on that side. You want this part of that? I'll, I'll go on the other. Go ahead. You, you choose. So he's being... You know, the, the the big man, bigger man, you know, okay, what you got? What, I got you. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. So he picked the, the, the plain of Jordan because he saw what? It was very, very, it was a fruitful, a land that's well watered, what's he thinking? More cattle, <laughs> right? Okay. But what did he pick? The plains of Sodom. <laughs> The grasses, that's that, that, that term. The grass is always greener on, greener on the other side. Okay. The, uh, the people that dwelt there, you know, not so great. <laughs> the land is good. The people ain't. So, it said, um, so let me read that again. Um, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. See. So before he destroyed it, the, Lot chose that land. But eventually, Lot had to what? Flee that land. Because he most are going to destroy that land that's going to be with fire and brimstone. It's going to be a, you know, a heap of fire. See? So, um, then it say, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. So, very fruitful land. Then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards where? Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So always remember that when they try to push this, uh, what agenda is it called? Um, So-called gay agenda. It's not gay. Gay means happy. Okay? The Sodomite agenda, homosexual agenda. That's what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah was all about. And the Most High called men with men, women with women, exceeding wickedness. So we're not supposed to be to each his own or I respect. Like the people, you know, what do you think about men marrying men? Well, what does the scripture say? It's, it's, it's a sin against God. It's a man being, having sex with a man, with a man, a man with man, uh, and the law of Moses and according to Christ in Romans 1 it's evil sin that has to be repented of that's, that's our answer like, like that's if you ask me you know what do I feel about a man taking the life of another man it's murder they gotta repent a man with another man a man marrying another man uh, then taking it to the transgender and all this there's scriptures on that. 
where that's all against the nature that the Most High created man and woman. So that's our answer. Well, that's Genesis. Well, then read in the book of one of the apostles of the Lord called Peter. Where he, Peter brought out that how the Lord destroyed the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was an example unto those that would live after, afterwards, that, that would live ungodly like them. That they all too, they too shall be destroyed. All right, now let's read on. Check this out. This is good. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look up from the place where thou art, northward, southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed forever. <laughs> so Abraham just made a move, right? That move, he amounted what? Treasures and the kingdom of heaven. So the Most High, again confirming, you know, his promise. Now let me know again. You can look to the north, right? Look to the south. So it must have been high enough where you can see from a view, north, south, west, and east. And the Lord is telling him, I'm going to give this to you and to your seed. The seed meaning Christ first and foremost, right? For an everlasting possession. So, so what is the Lord confirming to Abraham? I ain't got to fight over this land. This is the land here. That, this land here. Or any land. The whole land going to be given to me. That's what the Lord is confirming with Abraham. Abraham. Uh, before his name was changed to Abraham. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth... Then shall thy seed also be numbered. So this is talking about the seed that will come through his wife Sarah and having Isaac. If a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Can the sand of the sea be numbered? Neither can Abraham's offspring. So they're everywhere. North, Central, South America, Africa, Europe, islands, all Caribbean, all throughout the world and they all don't look like one specific type of person <laughs> but we come from Abraham Isaac Jacob different shades of brown light brown, dark brown light skin, dark skin woolly hair, straight hair curly hair, in between hair <laughs> everything. different color eyes and, and not because all because of Mixing. It's, all people come from Adam. So, you know, all colors come from one. You, you can't get light from dark, dark. Right? I mean, you can't get, I would say, it, um, white from black, black from white. So, then it says, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So the Lord told Abraham, walk. Take your journeys throughout the whole land. And as you go on through these journeys and you see, I'm going to give it to you. For an everlasting. And this wouldn't be in his lifetime either. When Abraham died, he didn't get it. The only land that he really had was the land that he brought to bury his wife. In himself in. <laughs> That's all he was with. He is, his mind was about the resurrection. He knew that what? That what I got in this time, and he was a rich man. And he was able to, you know, live here, live there. And, but he wasn't moved by that. He was moved by what? This is talking about the kingdom of God. That's what we're talking about here. So Abraham didn't receive this yet, but in the resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ, he going to get this. He going to get this blessing. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. See, so I see everywhere Abraham was, he was building altars to the Lord to worship God. Hebron, that was one of his cities of refuge. Where a manslayer can um, 
flee to. And if it was an accident, then he had to wait to the death of the high priest in that city, and then he would be allowed to go back to his land. But if he was guilty of murder and he was fleeing to go there, and inquisition was made and it was determined that no, you did that out of malice, then, then whoso shed man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. All right, so let's go back to uh, Matthew 5. That I say of uh, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of what? Judgment. So we have to know that if we're angry with, a, with another brother without a cause, we're in danger of being judged as a murderer. Now, just to make a point now, let's say a brother did offend you. Okay. Then we have to apply the scriptures. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not take vengeance. Don't be grudging against a man, being bitter. Thou shalt any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Correct him. Love your neighbors yourself. So always be on guard against anger, especially without a cause, because we're in danger of doing something that's going to lead to murder. In the eyes of God, being angry where that's murder. So that's why we need to what? Control our anger. And if we don't know how to control our anger, we can end up in a circumstance where we're in jail or we kill somebody. And you're like, man, how did it happen so fast? And it was that anger, that uncontrollable rage. So it's something that we really, really have to be on top of. It's going to say anger and wrath shorteneth the life. Diminishes your life. So, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. So that word Raka means vain fellow. So, back during the time of Christ, let's say I saw Phil, right? And I call him Raka. That was like, Kind of like despising words, an insult. Like oh, there you go, bro. Like very, yeah, it's it it an insult. Like, like Raka, vain fellow, mm. vain fellow. I would be in danger of being brought before what a council, and the judges making an inquisition and having to deal with that ordeal. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So calling a brother a car, you're in danger of the council of men. Christ saying, look, you, you call a brother a fool, you're in danger of unquenchable fire, man, in the day of judgment. So basically he's saying, look, you can get in trouble for calling a man a car and being brought before the council of men and having to deal with that. But I'm telling you, you, you call a brother a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. You're in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, see, now let's say you have a gift that you're going to bring to the altar, you know, it's going to be used for the most highest purpose, you know, well, and there remembers that that brother hath ought against thee, see, but you remember that what? A brother's angry with you, right? Brother hath ought against you because you offended him. Leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be what? Reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Like Abraham. Before he built that altar to the Lord, right? He had to be what? Make sure that him and his brother straight, right? <laughs> so that would be similar, you know, before we throw up our prayers and, you know, we're going to pray to the Most High. You know what? I gotta be, I gotta be set at one with my brother here, man. There's strife between us, you know. I, I've, my brother has ought against me because I what? I offended him. So let me deal with the brother I offended before I give my gift to the altar. See, before I make amends with God, let me make sure I make amends with my brother. 
How am I going to appear before God and try to please him and I'm not trying to deal right with my brother? Agree with that adversary quickly. So, you know, I, I was taught when I was young in this faith, that's talking about Esau, cops, LAPD, whatever, you know, Boston PD. The adversary would agree quickly is, is this is actually going into a brother that we offended. It's all This is all flowing one after another. While thou art in the way with him. See, because there's a strife between y'all. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the what? The judge. See, so what judge is this is talking about? It's talking about the judges in Israel. This ain't talking about Esau's courts. So it says, and the judge deliver thee to the officer. Again, this officer is not talking about officer of the law. It's talking about officers within the, the government of Israel. Remember they sent officers to apprehend the Lord those are not Roman cops they were officers because when you read in the law of Moses you had captains, you had officers, you had judges so that's all dealing within the, the, the courts of Israel what we read in here See? so I said lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and then the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison See, like put in ward. And then you see what happened. Because remember when the man was, most I gave the law about when not to kindle the fire on the Sabbath, and then you had the man gathering sticks on the Sabbath. What did they do? They put him in ward. They put him like in a prison. The apostles of the Lord, they were put in prison. See, for the Lord's sake. So a lot of this was dealing with Israel. The Israel was during our time of Christ, they were dealing you know, with wickedness a lot of times in those circumstances. So, you know, you might be dealing in situations and instances where, you know, because you offended your brother and you, you might have did something where now rest, some type of restitution may be involved. And, you know, so what the Lord is saying is, look, avoid these predicaments, avoid these situations, avoid these circumstances. Agree with that. Average. Look, what did I do to offend you? All right, this, you know what did that? Uh, did I, you know, like the uh, like in, in one of the parables in the scriptures, the one of the guys said, "Look, or oh, not a parable, it was actually a man." He said, "Look, if, if I have accused any man falsely, I I try to make it right. If if I took something that wasn't mine, I I restore sevenfold." So that's what this is going into. So this adversary is the it's going into the one that you offended. When you offend someone, try to be reconciled. Because if you don't get reconciled, and now it goes to the courts, and now you're dealing with courts and of Israel, you know, during this time, you might end up in prison. That's why I say, verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the other most farthing. And you ain't gonna get out of that situation till you know you paid your way out of that circumstance, out of that restitution or that's old or whatever it may be so the whole gist of what the Lord is saying towards the end of this thing is that's why let me go back to that the 23rd verse therefore therefore because of what if thou bring thy altar see therefore if thou bring thy gift unto the altar and, and rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee Leave thy, what it say? Leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly. See? So he's not jumping a whole time. He's not talking about how we to deal with one another's brothers and then now he's going into the cops. Now, of course, with the powers that be, the most I said, you know, Obey the powers that be, but that's that was scripture. But what this is going into the adversaries, the enemy, is the one that the adversary that that we may have created because we we offended the brother hath art against us. That's why he was telling us in the beginning. Look, if you say to your brother, you know, thou fool, you in danger, you know, of hellfire. 
because you're going to do something to offend him, and then now you now it's it's he's your adversary. So that's what this is going into. Agree with thine adversary quickly. So the adversaries amongst your people, the ones that you may have offended, try to be reconciled. Because once you do that, right, then you can give and present your all gift before the altar and render unto God that which is God's. But if we don't do that, what's it going to lead to? You you gonna pay? You gonna you, you know the agree? You know, thou shalt not come out, verse verse 26. Thou shalt by no means come out thence to thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Okay? So all that is all flowing. That's why verse 24. Therefore. See? Therefore. So everything is flowing. So he's not talking about dealing one another. And then flipping the topic and dealing with um, Esau's courts and things like that. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what's adultery? Remember we got, that's, that's the law in Exodus 2014. Thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. What is adultery? Go to uh, Deuteronomy, um, Leviticus, same book of Leviticus, go to Leviticus 18.20. Leviticus It says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. See, that's adultery. A man sleeping with another man's woman, his wife. They're together. But if a man sleeps with another man's wife, that's, that's adultery. What, what was the judgment for that? Go to Deuteronomy 22 22. Deuteronomy 22, 22. Okay, in this society, a lot of this rap music, right, and R&B music, uh, country music, whatever music, they promote what? Adultery, fornication, unlawful sexual acts, you know, things of that nature. So Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put away what? What does it say? Evil from Israel. So adultery is evil, man. Okay, but you got songs. Oh, you know, wrong with little bump and grind. And you can look, but don't touch, right? Yeah, all the... And it ain't and just the 2000 era. This is during the time of Moses, man. So adultery is not new. <laughs> adultery was brought in once that sin entered into the world in the garden. So let's go back to Matthew 5. Going back to that point, by calling somebody a fool, you know, there's usually underlying circumstances too behind that. So that's why before we were always saying, like, before you offer that gift, gift a, a, a gift before the altar and give to the Most High, make sure you do it right with your brother and it may be reconciled with him. And when you're dealing with that brother, agree with him, especially if we're wrong. 
because then you're going to end up in a bad circumstance. That's the point. So, uh, Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her. Already. Where? In his heart. It's in his heart. Remember um, when we read about David committing adultery with Bathsheba? Where did that sin begin? In his heart. When he started, when he looked upon her. He saw her bathing on the rooftop. And then once he started to look at her and lust after her, the sin was already conceived where? In, in his heart. Once it's in our heart, meaning our mind, and that sin is set in motion, you can't put the brakes on it. So that's wrong. Oh, you can look, but don't touch. That's not the scriptures. Like a bullet being fired. What's that, bro? Just like a bullet being fired. You can't yeah. Get it yeah. Once it's fired, brother, you can't stop it, man. Once that sin is set in motion, you can't put the brakes on it. How do you know? Because before he slept with her, he inquired who she was. Well, who's that woman? He didn't, they didn't, he didn't ask, oh, I saw her. Well, who's, who lives over there? Oh, that's such and such. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's married to one of the men in your army. You would think when he heard that, oh, man. Shoo. One of my men. I mean, it was wrong to begin with, but once he found out that she was married, it even made it worse. Mm -hmm. And then she married to a man in his army that was loyal to him, laid down his life for him, for the army of Israel. He met up with her anyway and slept with her. And then what? Well, at first, no, first he, he tried to cover it up and tried, once she started showing pregnancy, oh, you know, like, she said, she, she came, oh, I'm pregnant. Oh, all right. You know, he got the guy eating and drinking. Oh, go to your wife. Hey, go home. I was like, no. Fighting the war, war of Israel. It ain't time to be eating and drinking like this. We're standing right here. Ready, we're ready to protect the army of Israel. So he saw that wasn't working. He says, all right. He told one of his men, send him to the most hottest part of the war where, where the battle is, the engagement of the battle is going to be the most fierce. And set him up to be killed. David did that. Set him up to be killed. See? So it started with lust. The lust led to you know, um, a set of circumstances where it led to eventually murder. Well, it led to adultery first, and then eventually murder. In the pro he's serving another God. Is that the God of Israel? He's serving, doing this as king? So it's off on so many levels. So, but I say unto you, verse 28, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after hath committed adultery with her in his heart. So vice versa for a sister. She lusting after a man, that man, you know, and especially she married, that's, that's adultery. So it starts with lust. So what does Christ teach us in verse 29? And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. So what does that mean? In the circumstances of adultery. To put off the lust, you got to not be around that woman no more. <laughs> be around women, period, like that. So, if your right eye offend thee, you got to pluck it out and cast it from you, meaning flee from sin. Okay, like when the woman was caught in the act of adultery in John 8, Christ forgave her, right? Okay, what happens next week or next month, right? And she's lusting after a man, and she married. What should she learn? I'd have to avoid coming this way, coming, being in this circumstance, being in this situation, being around this man, because I know what happened. So I have to mortify. What's well, Chris talking about? Mortify the, the works, the deeds of the flesh. So we have to go through extreme measures. To cut off sin. As we're working our way to what? Put off that sin through, through, the, through, the, through applying the scriptures and changing. 
So you, so we have to pluck out our right eye and cast it from it. Because if we pluck out our right eye and we put it right there, it's going to what? You attach yourself. <laughs> and we know the Lord is talking about actually taking your right eye out because what happened? You gonna lust with your left eye. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, what is he talking about? He's talking about spiritually we have to what? Go through extreme measures to put off sin. To, even to the point where it's almost killing us because we're so used to operating in a certain way, lustful, now to be the opposite of that, it's like, it feels like literally like, uh, you know. I remember a brother back in the Boston church where we had to like come with these scriptures like in, in the church because what was happening was certain things was tolerated where, you know, all like be in certain places where, you know, oh, it's not so bad, it's innocent, it's just, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but... What what was happening, brothers, was lusting after women, and um, so like going to certain places. I'm not talking about like bad places, but like places where it could even be among brothers and sisters. Or, but some of these sisters are not really in the scriptures, especially. So what was happening was brothers would, you know, get togethers, whatever, music, drinking, and then brothers end up fornicating with these sisters lusting after these women. And then we started bringing out scriptures like this. And the brother's like, brother, this is like, like I, I gotta kill myself now. It's like, I, I can't be who I am. Like, I don't know. I don't know any other way to be. And I'm like, well, all that stuff, we was deceiving ourselves. That, that's all dealing fornication and adultery. See? And that this sin right here became a big a brother ended up leaving the fellowship. Being going in the world and like, Going all out in fornication. Met the brother years later. Man, that brother was in rough shape, man, spiritually. You know? And, you know, it reminded me because when we was bringing out scriptures like this, he's like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, well, so we can't even, like, like go, even go like a club or, like, you know, just get together and, you know, just have some drinking and music? Nah, not in the state we in, man. We, we need to, like, we need to cut off sin. Like totally. So, f f for so it, it's like you got it's like you're doing this, uh, ah, and it hurts, and then you got ah, throw it away, and so that means fleeing from sin, avoiding circumstances and situations where you know that one thing can lead to another, and we could deceive ourselves into thinking, oh, there's nothing wrong. We're just hanging out, yeah. But you know, wine and women will make men of understanding the fall. That's the scriptures. Wine and women would make men of understanding to fall. So that's why Christ said, if that right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. So we can't be playing with the sin. That's the point. You got to cut it off. So you got to cut off the companionship, the friendship. You got to cut off the music. Stop listening to that music. Instead of the drinking is... You listen to that music, get in that vibe, the drinking, and you're around these women. What's going on? Is that fleeing from sinners from the face of a servant? Is that plucking out your eye and casting it from you? No. So the Lord's like, stop playing. And avoid these circumstances, even if it hurts you in the beginning. Because, like Christ's going to say, if, if, if that right eye offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee, you know, it is, for it is profitable, profitable for thee, that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into what? Hell. It's better that you go into the kingdom with one eye than two eyes defiled. It's better that you go in the kingdom and you made all these extreme, difficult cuts, you know, cutoffs. And, and, you know, you, you, man, it's like as you're making these moves, like, I gotta, man, I gotta stop drinking. Okay. I gotta stop listening to this music. I gotta start avoid. I gotta avoid that corner, avoid that street. I gotta avoid hanging around these sisters here. I gotta avoid that house. I, I gotta avoid. And you, so at the first, it's like, you're literally like, it's a struggle. It's like, oh, it's like, it feels like you've taken out your right eye and plucked. Now you got one eye, and it's like, oh, I'm used to both eyes. Yeah, but that eye is defiling you. So it's better you walk around like this, all hurt, and eventually be healed. And, <laughs> you know, not make those necessary cutoffs within ourselves. And our whole body be the fault. So avoid sinful situations. Avoid temptation. 
avoid being around people where one thing's going to lead to another, and then the next, you know, now you're involved with them in a manner where now it's, it's adultery, <coughs> fornication. Okay, the person might not be married, and you might not be married. Well, that could go into the way of, of lust, fornication. See, so these are the things we have to be on guard against. So now we see why we got to be a new creature. See, oh, I never murdered no one. I, I never commit adultery. Do we get angry? <laughs> do we lust? Yeah, yeah. So do we got to be a new creature? Yeah. So we're not as good as we, perfect as we think, squeaky clean as we think we are. There's a lot that we can work on within ourselves. So that's why we were reading, going back to the point, um, we're going to have to end the lesson here. Um, what were we reading? Was it second? What, what, what scripture led us to Matthew 5? John 1 and 4. No, the one we were... There's a reason why... Was, Corinthians 5, if any man be a new creature. Right? Was it that point? Right. Second one. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, let's read that, and Lord, we'll, we'll get to the Passover next week. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. Why? Because we plucked out our right eye and what? Cast it from us. And that allowed our body, our spirit to be a habitation for what? The Father and Christ to make their abode within us. But can the Father in Christ make that abode within us if we're not willing to pluck out our eye and cast it from us? No. <clears throat> Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The past is the past. We become new. Nothing is against us. No, no. Our sins is not held against us. Even the woman that committed adultery, if the Lord forgave her, everybody else got forgiven. Right? When the Lord said, I forgive you, he said, she, she said, did any man condemn you to be put to death? She said, no man condemned you. Neither do I condemn you. See? So everybody else got to, they can't condemn. They can't see you the next day. You whore. No, I'm not. The Lord forgave me. I'm a new creature. Mm. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, if you don't want to forgive me, like Jesus said to the multitude that was ready to kill me, he that is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Bye. <laughs> See? <laughs> now, let's read verse, uh, the scripture we wanted to in that same chapter, verse 21. For he hath made him, meaning God made Christ. So we're in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him to be sin for us. Meaning God made Christ to be sin for us. So the sins that we committed, Christ became us. He took upon our sin. Who knew no sin. Because the Lamb of God that John spoke about was Jesus to take away our what? Sin, but it had to be one that was without what? Sin. sin. To take away our sin, right? Could it be Moses died for us and we're forgiven? No, Moses himself is a sinner. For he had made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we would that we might be made the righteousness of God in what? Mm -hmm. So we're made the righteousness of God through who? Through Christ. That's what makes us righteous. So we got to be born again in Christ. And remember, we read in Exodus 12 that that lamb had to be without blemish, and it prefigured who? Christ, because we read in Hebrews 9 that Christ offered himself without spot. So there's more scriptures on that. So Lord will, next Sabbath, we go into some of the scriptures. So that way when the Passover come in, we'll be a little more wiser. All right, so I'll praise to the Most High in Christ. Uh, let's do the prayers.
Psalm 119 and 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have, de I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes, I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do error from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. All praises to the Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the fellowship today and the scriptures today. Thank you for the Sabbath. And we pray for the healing also as well as all the brothers and sisters that are going through different sicknesses and infirmities. We pray for the healing of our brothers and sisters, the healing of ourselves. We pray for mercy, forgiveness, compassion, and the understanding to better our ways that we may do the things that are pleasing in your eyes. Thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'll uh, read the scripture, Matthew 26. So I'll read the scripture, Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So this ordinance the Lord gave to his disciples on the day that he was going to be killed during the preparation of the Passover, the 14th day of the first month. Because Christ was being prepared to be killed. He was prepared to bear our sins on the cross that he was going to die on. And through him, we're made righteous with God. So we want to eat this bread and drink this wine worthily. Memorializing our Lord's death till he come. The Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bless our bread and wine, which represents the body and the blood of the Lord. This we do in remembrance of you until your second coming. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll, we'll do the anointing now. Any brothers and sisters want to get anointed? According to the scripture in James 5. James 5 and 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, so we do the anointing with the oil. We pray to the Father in the name of the Lord to, for the healing of, 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 of brothers and sisters that are getting anointed. So we'll do that. So Peace and blessings to everyone on the video.
Sacrifice bless you all. Peace and blessings.